I, I joined the British Army and spent three years then with the, uh, with the British SAS, the Special Forces. And during this time, I had a, uh, a free fall parachuting accident where, uh, where I had a canopy uh, rip and two at about 16,000 feet in Africa as it was getting dark and just, uh, just came spiraling down very, very fast, uh, blacked out and, and smashed into the desert and broke my back then in three different places and spent really then the next 18 months uh, back in the UK, strapped up in, uh, in braces and in plaster uh, in what they call uh, military rehabilitation, uh, which is really just a posh word for a horrible hospital. <laughs> uh, but I just remember lying there during these months with the doctors not, not knowing you know, not knowing if I was going to be able to do, you know, just to be able to walk again properly, let alone do this one thing that I could now do well, uh, which was to climb. And suddenly this dream of Everest that I had held on to for so long, it just seemed out of what I could uh, believe in. Uh, the highest camp in the world at 26,000 feet. And what they say now is that above 26,000 feet, uh, you enter what's known as the, uh, as the death zone. Uh, the death zone is a phenomenally uninspiring uh, term. <laughs> you know, the Brits would never have called it the death zone. You know, the, we would have called it something like the oops, not particularly nice zone, you know. <laughs> uh, but the reason it's called the death zone is for the simple fact that the human body now cannot survive up here. You can't digest food, and your body begins just to eat into its own muscle and bone in this struggle for this precious energy. Uh, it's an extraordinary ridge where just in the shadow where it's dark, it drops straight down vertically uh, for 11,000 vertical feet straight down uh, to the plains of Tibet below. Uh, this is the highest, most exposed uh, ridge in the world and actually a lot of it's kind of you know cornerstone over so you're really climbing on top of you know like just ice with nothing underneath no solid ground underneath you and I remember at one point just resting with my ice axe between my boots and it just went <laughs> and pulling it out and seeing this hole of air for 11,000 feet between my toes <laughs> and just having one of those you know one of those moments I'm just thinking this is a really bad place to be climbing. <laughs> uh, the descent, though, for us then uh, really turned into a whole series of nightmares. And so often, you know, coming down is the most dangerous part. And the reason for this is all that adrenaline and dream and focus and drive has been for that pinnacle. And you never really kind of think about the descent and that adrenaline gets replaced by this exhaustion and you want to be able to click your fingers and be in a hot bath with bubbles and ducks and <laughs> good things like that. You know, but this is really why so many of the accidents happen. That concentration goes and, uh, you know, we, we ran out of oxygen. We ended up just crawling on our hands and knees uh, through these deep powder snow gullies. Uh, but eventually, you know, five days later, uh, we were off it. And, you know, for me, I think, you know, looking back, there is one very clear quality that stands out above everything that happened up there. And this thing stand out, stands out for a couple of reasons. First of all, I genuinely believe this thing kept us alive. And secondly, it's what gave me hope. And hope is one of these strange elements so that we don't know how much we all really need it in our lives. But this thing might be different from what you initially imagined really made the difference on that mountain. And it's this. Uh, and, it was something, and if you remember nothing more of my rabbiting on, uh, remember, remember this. And it was something I was told on the first day of ever joining the Special Forces. And I remember at the end of this, long selection process where 180 of us had been whittled down uh, to four of us 
And this guy who had never seen before came in, stood in front of us, and said this. The difference between ordinary and extraordinary is often just that little word, extra. And the work I'm going to now ask you to do is not going to be ordinary. It's going to be extraordinary. But what's going to make the difference is when not one ounce of you thinks you can. You're the people who over this last year have shown me you can turn around and give me that little bit extra. And it's that that's going to make your work